Hello everyone, um, welcome to our Earth Journalism Network webinar on using data to investigate pangolin trafficking. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Amy Sim and I'm the project manager for Internews Earth Journalism Network Asia Pacific project. Um, first of all, I hope every one of you and your family are keeping well um, during this coronavirus pandemic. I guess many of you joining us here are journalists or are interested in journalism. Um, I thank you for your work, helping to keep the public and your communities informed um, of the facts and latest knowledge on COVID-19 and other relevant um, environmental issues, including this one we're covering today on uh, wildlife trafficking. Um, and more specifically on the pangolin trade, as uh, you may have seen, research studies um, have found the pangolin to be a potential intermediary host that transmitted the new uh, coronavirus from bats to people. Um, the pangolin um, is also the world's uh, most uh, trafficked mammal. Um, so today I'm very happy to be joined by our, by our friends Patrick Berler, uh, Trang Bui and Xu Jiaming from the Environmental Reporting Collective. Um, they've put together a very good series of reports across um, several Asian countries on the trading of pangolin and their parts. They'll be sharing with us today how they use data from court documents and uh, local media reports to gain new insights into the pangolin trade. Um, at EJN Earth Journalism Network, we have also been uh, covering um, the trafficking of pangolin in Asia as well as track um, the, the trafficking route from Africa to Asia. Um, these stories can be found on our website at earthjournalism.net. Um, before I turn over to Patrick, Jiaming, and Chuang, um, just want to say a few words about the Earth Journalism Network, um, in case some of you are not very familiar with it. Um, so the Earth Journalism Network, or EJN for short, is a project of Internews, uh, which is an international media development um, international organization. Um, Earth Journalism Network is a community of around 12,000 journalists from 180 countries um, who share uh, the same passion for environmental reporting. Um, at EJN, we work closely with um, our community to improve the quantity and quality of environmental reporting. Um, and we do this through uh, a range of activities, including story grants, um, uh, fellowships, to conferences, um, mentoring, workshops, and so on and so forth. Um, you can find out more information uh, about EJN uh, from our website and if you like, um, I encourage you to sign up if you haven't yet. Um, it's free to sign up as a member on our website and um, by signing up you'll be able to find out about all the different types of opportunities that, that we provide um, and regularly um, uh, announce on our website. This webinar is one of a series of webinars that EJN is holding about COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases and the environmental origins like the wildlife trade and more widely uh, looking at human pressure on the environment as well as the impact of COVID-19 um, on the environment. Um, for this webinar today, we have allocated an hour and a half um, of time and we will have our guests speakers uh, present for the first 40 minutes and leave a uh, lot of time um, for questions and answers after that. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar and it would be good if you can put down um, your name and where you're from along with your questions. We will collect your questions and answer them um, after the presentation or uh, some of our uh, presenters may answer them straight away uh, on the Q&A uh, feature on, on, the, on this webinar. Um, there is also a chat function, but um, I ask that you only use the Q&A feature for sending questions, so it will be easier for us to collect these questions and address them um, in, in the webinar. Uh, EJN has two more uh, webinars coming out that are targeting Asian audience. Uh, one will take place tomorrow on reporting on the animal trade and zoonotic diseases, focusing on um, the situation in the Philippines at 3 p.m. Manila time tomorrow. Um, we have another webinar uh, scheduled for the 6th of May at 2 p.m. Thailand and Vietnam time. Uh, looking at how we can leverage um, existing data sources to look at how 
COVID-19 and other environmental threats like climate change and air pollution combined um, are, are impacting on, um, on vulnerable communities. We will also introduce a new Asia wildlife trafficking um, tracking tool known as WildEye Asia at that uh, webinar. Um, so for now, I will turn over to Patrick to introduce himself and our two other speakers. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Amy. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for joining us for this webinar. And uh, and, and thanks to um, Internews and the Earth Journalist Network for for also uh, giving us this opportunity to show um, our reporting, uh, share our reporting with you. Um, we'll be sharing um, not only our reporting, but also um, how we did it. And we'll also share links to the data so that you can also do the same reporting uh, in, in uh, w w wherever you are. Um, first, I'd like to uh, kind of show you the, well, this is a pangolin. <laughs> um, so this is kind of the challenge that we're faced uh, when we do, when we did this kind of story, we started investigating the, pang the pangolin, uh, the global trade in pangolins uh, in uh, late 2018. And this is kind of the challenge you have. This is the, 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 at the, the, the Vietnamese border to China. How do, you, how do you, on a global scale, monitor something that gets smuggled across borders uh, uh, like this one? Uh, and it's not declared and you don't find any you don't find any official records of its trade and it's not regulated and of course it's illegal so how how can you find uh, data on this and how can you use data to kind of investigate it and uh, just to show you this is from our partners in Viet in, in, in Myanmar uh, the wildlife uh, at a market at a roadside market in Myanmar there's a pangolin uh, being sold there and you can really if you look at this, you you are at that road. You see the pangolin, but how do you like? How do you do the big picture? How do you tra do the re the whole supply chain of poachers from Africa, from Southeast Asia to to China, sometimes Vietnam? Um, to sh show you the pangolin, because they hope I hope the video works. Um, um let's see so um so we teamed up as a group of journalists uh, to investigate uh, this trade and kind of to brainstorm what what data we could use and what what approaches we could use uh, uh to 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 report this story and you see we're about 40 40 journalists involved in um, three continents and uh, this is a look at the, in, in, at the various smuggling routes that we have come across. And you can tell, you can see here that the, 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 it's truly a global scale and local journalists can hardly do justice uh, to this reporting on this global scale. You really need to collaborate across borders to understand what is, what is happening. Um, so there are three approaches to uh, data that we looked at. And the first one is of course the, um, the pricing. Uh, so what is the price of a pangolin that will tell you something. And we look at criminal cases and, 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 and Trang and Jamming will walk you through that. And then we'll look at the legal use, the registered use, what kind of public data you can use to, to, uh, to get a glimpse of, of the use of pangolins. For uh, the pricing, one thing is we did we, across our group of uh, our team is we asked everyone to ask the poachers, the traders, the smugglers, the, 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 the pharmaceutical companies that actually buy the pangolin scales uh, for how much, what the, what the current market rates are for pangolin scales and, and meat. And that uh, and that gives you a picture of what the current situation in one market is, and you could actually track that over time. But what we did is we we kind of used it to 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 uh, reconstruct the supply chain, uh, assuming that they're of course cheapest uh, at the beginning of the supply chain and the most expensive where they end 
And this is kind of uh, uh, an overall picture. The, the data, of course, is subject to variation. It changes within countries, and it changes uh, uh, um, it, it changes all the time. But you do get a you do get a good sense of what is happening. So, so if you're looking into wildlife trade, I also encourage you, and you have access to poachers, smugglers, uh, traders, or uh, or law enforcement who also might have insights. Uh, then I encourage you to really track the price to see the bigger trends. And uh, so this is one, one kind of reporting that we did in Myanmar that uh, Jiaming did with friends from, our, um, from um, Myanmar Now, which is a fantastic online publication there. And we went to the wildlife markets and we went to, the, uh, to, to major cities, Yangon and Mandalay, and tried to find out what the prices are. And it really gives you a sense of how the trade is flowing within the country as well. I, I would, would now move on to criminal cases and seizures. There are plenty of resources actually. There's a lot of data on criminal cases. And here are some sources. Um, we'll, we'll share these links with you later and you'll find a lot of data on source, uh, on legal cases. But you'll, you'll find, as, as, as Trang will sh show you, uh, that there's still much to be done and there is a lot of potential for additional reporting on seizures and how to systematically visualize and report on them. We, what we did is we looked at the Chinese court records and uh, that, that was uh, uh, Jamming's work. So what we did is we, we collected uh, all the Chinese court records we could find on uh, in the official database uh, that were related to pangolin smuggling, and we analyzed them. And I'll, I'll pass on pass the word to Jiaming. Um, Jiaming, um, do you want to describe quickly like what we see what we see here? And um... yeah, hello, this is Jiaming. I'm the reporter of the Environmental Reporting Collective. Last year, I participated in a Pangolin report and has been to Myanmar with Ting and Vietnam with Trump here to do collaboration report. And in this page, you can see it's a, it's a map with different location points and smuggling route that guide us doing our stories. I'll explain the dark blue points is important cities with, with a lot of Myanmar Chinese or Chinese people living. The yellow one are, the, are where we have leads and information. The most important data is the light blue points and the red points across the Myanmar and China border. This is a data from China Judgment Online system. It's all open to public. And the data used here is 26 cases from that system that uh, specific mentioned locations in Myanmar. It gave you information about case time uh, when it got caught and the smuggling route, item, person's name, prison term. So the data draws all the lines between Myanmar and China of, of, of smuggling route that is open to public, like top cities across the border. And this data can be found openly in China judgment online. And it has many commercial sites that scraping the official data and made it more user friendly. I will share with you later. The story here we, be, we, we, we do based on this data is that we've been to five cities and have been see a lot of pangolins or pangolin skills that been trafficked in a plain site in Myanmar. And what is interesting and important is that uh, where we and a lot watching group think that uh, it should most happening in remote or dangerous or ethnic group uh, part that, that uh, mentioned in this map. Our interview found that new route, new, the new way of smuggling, our way that is uh, neglected, is that the, actually the biggest border city or the checkpoint between Myanmar and China, the Muse and really is uh, probably plays a very big important role in smuggling. It's, it is a legal custom. It's a, it is controlled by both central government. And this is how the data get us and back up when we're doing our report. 
go to the next one yeah okay thank you so in so, this page is also from uh, the the court the call system it is a very interesting case what you see here is also locations related with one very big case in china that tell us a lot about uh, methods inside a big smuggling group the red point across china and malaysia tells us the route where it starts where it trade and where they they were caught up by the place and the yellow line was the route from malaysia to china the yellow or the red green points in china and in malaysia is where the smuggler come from where their hometown was and the, the blue ones was the facilities and addresses that happens in 2019 with more than 13 tons of uh, pangolin skills and the two case and many in common in the blue points so we think they are connected so the data used here is also uh, from the, the judgment we can see is that uh, it is um, almost 10 tons of pangolin or pangolin scales or frozen pangolin or live pangolins and their worth is about uh, 5 million RMB at least and the case was so important because so interesting and stand out that the one Malaysian man he was given to lifetime imprisonment which is very rare in law practice in China because it's a foreigner see and also four Chinese people, one for 10 years and three for five years. What they got, these four Chinese men, they got 8,000 RMB for each smuggling movement. It's like about 1,000 US dollars. It's quite, quite small. Sometimes they eat a pangolin at treatment. And the story here is that uh, we have a lot of small cases in China, but we don't know the big, big case. Why the smuggler doing it? Who they are? I think in the low end, they are, the, many of them, they are low end pre, poor fishermen. They're doing it for money to feed their family. And they have limited choice because all the fish village was very poor. And actually the bosses were not hurt in the case. We've visited the smuggler's hometown in China and in Malaysia. And we've talked to their families. Uh, the, the people in Malaysia, the boss gave compensation to his family for one year, but then disappeared. So that gave us a big picture of the cases. And also the case was involved with Hong Kong, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and China. Hong Kong has a point, mm -hmm. transport point with boss living there, and they are actually still free out there. So it's about big case. It's about this page. It's a called, yeah. This one. Mm -hmm. Okay, this two is that uh, uh, our data team, they also doing a keyword searching and heat map. On the left is that they are, they are searching on the pangolin case, seizures and the, the worst of the seizures. And you can see the big case happened in Shanghai, Guangdong and Yunnan. And they are very high, pro, high, high, high worth, like uh, uh, more than 8 million RMB. So you can see the business is very big. It's a big business. and uh, profit business and we can see in the red is that we're searching also on the judgment system with keywords related with eat pangolin or restaurant or meat and we see that uh, the people consumption it like uh, eat it the mainly happening in the southeast part of china or the south part of china like yunnan guangdong fujian Zhejiang, they have a tradition or they may like to eat pangolin. That gave us a big picture and context to understand the situation. Yeah. Thank you, Jianling. Yeah, thank, um, thank you. Let's move on to Vietnam and Trang. Um, Trang, uh, uh, in, in Vietnam, it was, wasn't, uh, you didn't, you, we didn't have a searchable data set. So Trang, built one and uh, she's going to show us quickly how uh, how she how she did that hi Tran. well thanks patrick um hi everyone 
So I'm very delighted to be sharing today. Um, I'd like to thank Internews for organizing this webinar and thank you all for attending this webinar. So I'm Chang Bui, I'm a reporter of the Environmental Reporting Collective. Um, so last year I was part of the Paneling Reports uh, project and I cover Vietnam. Um, what I did during the project was a mixture of data reporting and undercover investigations. Um, the undercover investigation parts I did with jamming in Hanoi and in the Vietnam-China border. Um, but today I'll be talking mainly about uh, my data reporting during the Pangolin Reports project. Um, why is it important to look at data? How did I do it? And what results um, did it came out? So I hope what I'll be sharing uh, can inspire you to start incorporating data uh, within your work. So first, uh, why did I uh, build my own data? Um, before uh, working on the project, I interviewed several NGOs in Vietnam working in conservation and strengthening legal frameworks. Um, they all confirmed that Vietnam participates in three roles of the pangolin trade. So the country is a demand, transit, and then supply country. Um, we then have the name of demand and supply countries, but where and exactly how the pangolins are smuggled, we really don't know for sure. So we wanted to find patterns, and that's when I thought that we need data. Um, so how did I do it? Um, because in Vietnam, there's not an open uh, system uh, like in China. The official court system in Vietnam is still uh, under construction. Sometimes it's broken down. Um, but luckily, the media reports in Vietnam, um, we do have a lot of detailed um, media report. And especially the custom, they have um, a news website that update almost every single seizure um, of pangolins. So I thought that's a really good place to start. And then I compile about um, 100 cases. Uh, starting from, I think, 2010, 2010 until uh, last year. And then I started to work on an uh, interactive map that I, I hope that maybe in the end, the result could tell us how the pangolins are smuggling in Vietnam. So I'll go through like uh, four steps that I did uh, so that you have a uh, bigger pictures of um, what was the, the real technique and maybe it, you can apply that to your work. Uh, it's really not that complicated. Um, so Patrick in the next uh, the slide for me, thank you. Um, so the first step was uh, to gather and calm the data into an Excel file. Um, what's important when you work with interactive maps is that you need, um, for me, it, it's my way of work only. I don't know how other journalists do it, but me, I do have map coordinates of the place that the incidents happened so that the map uh, um, platform, the mapping platform, we can read it better. And then when you have that uh, file, you save that into the CSV format. It's a very popular format for um, mapping platform to read. And then, um, next slide, please. And then when you have the data, you import the data into a GIS system. Uh, it's a stand for Geographic uh, Information System. There are many out there, but uh, personally, I use ArcGIS. This is uh, a platform that uh, GIJN uh, the Global Investigative uh, Journalism Network, um, they introduced in one of their conferences. Um, so you import it, uh, you import the file into this platform. In uh, next step, uh, next slide, please. Oops, so, yeah. One second. This one? Yeah. Thank Sorry. you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, when you import uh, the data, uh, make sure that the visualization uh, looks accurate. Uh, you don't want to, like one pangolin that uh, looks the same as 100 pangolin Cs. So you have to tweak the ratio a bit. Um, and so after editing the map, you will have the final uh, product, which is um, this slide. 
So I did a bit with color and I add a bit of um, background map. Um, and so uh, we have a final map. Um, and last one, uh, last step is that you put this um, information to the web. So it can be done by um, pasting an embedding link from RGIS, um, but you will need a subscription for this service. Um, in our case, in the Pangolin reports, because we have a lot of data coming from a lot of countries, so we had a programmer who, who did the final visualization for us um, based on my data and my um, map, uh, which looks like this. Um, so from this map, uh, it gives us uh, quite some results. Um, and it surprised me, to be honest, because when we started this project, I expected um, pangolin smuggling will be spread out over the country because Vietnam has such a long border with the demand country, which is China. We have over a thousand kilometers of border with China. And we also have a really long border with like the potentially supply countries like Laos and Cambodia. But it was very surprising to me that the domestic cases out of 100 cases that I could find uh, in the last 10 years um, just clearly form a, a, par a pardon of a route that goes strictly from this one border pass um, between Laos and Vietnam. It's uh, called Gao Chiao border pass. And then um, in the media reports, they a lot of times they say the pangolin is being transported to the north or specifically to a province um, between uh, the border province of Vietnam and China, which is Mong Cai, that you see is the um, end destination, the final destination. Um, there were also a, a few other scattered incidents um, on other remote areas, but uh, it was in very small quantity, basically just farmers uh, catching pangolins and wanted to sell a bit for money. Um, but it was not enough to form patterns uh, as strong as this one. Um, this is mostly for um, domestic brood and it's mostly live pangolins. So we can, we can see from this map here that live pangolins are being transported from Laos to uh, via Vietnam and then to China. Um, in terms of uh, frozen pangolins or scales, um, it was very clear to us that it comes mostly by air and by sea from Africa via um, other trans uh, transit countries such as Hong Kong or, or Singapore. Um, and so you must be wondering, like, how, what does this result help us with the reporting? It, it clearly help us um, visualize a much clearer pictures. Um, so we, we know how uh, smugglers get the pangolins from, how do they sell it, how do they transport it, uh, and then it help us to choose our um, fo focus for the undercover investigation, which is the Mongai uh, city. Yeah. It uh, borders with uh, Dongxing, China, and then uh, the river borders um, along these two towns. Um, so I think I have a bit of advice for for all the journalists um, uh, who has an, some interest in data reporting is that uh, a lot of time data can be the story it's itself and looking at the data you, you will have the big picture and you will be able to choose the, where to do the field work or undercover um, and especially with international crimes and smuggling network uh, data visualization is immensely useful um, so that you can easily understand uh, the smuggling trade. So that is my experience. Um, I hope it's useful. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Tran. That was excellent um, and, and really inspiring. Um, let's move on to if if my, yes, it works. Huh. Uh, let's move on to legal use. So. Um, some, someone asked in the Q&A already, what's the difference between legal use and illegal use in China? And uh, in China, there are legal uh, stockpiles of pangolin scales that can be used legally in traditional uh, Chinese medicine. And uh, because these things are legal and they're regulated and require a license, 
there is uh, data on where these, there are lists of, of, of hospitals and there is some data on where these things are. Um, you can of course look at the global trade, someone asked it in the Q&A, the, the CITES trade database, and also share the link in the, in, in the Q&A just now. Health Analytics Asia did a fabulous uh, visualization of the CITES trade database, uh, uh, global trade. So if you're looking into this, uh, it's a great way to start uh, by just looking at the visualization and playing around and looking at the various species and uh, you can get started there. We did, um, we did some more digging in China and I'll ask maybe Jiaming to come in quickly also to talk about uh, the licensed pharma companies that we have found. Uh, um, Jiaming, do you want to describe what we see here? Yeah, this is thank a, you. yeah, thank you, Patrick. This is a, a data site that uh, related with all legal pangolin skill used in traditional Chinese medical. And this data should be open to public, but they become not open to search since 2016. We obtained it from a trusted and very famous NGO in China. They had this archive in 2016. In the list, we can see there's a, there are 209 companies and uh, produced 78 kinds of med medicine that uh, with pangolin skills inside it. The, this data set need to be updated, but it's not very easy to do. So the data used here is that uh, we know where to go. We, uh, we search uh, for the province like Guangdong in this uh, shared, uh, shared Excel. Uh, there's uh, three companies and we visit them. We visit two in Guangdong and uh, we know another company that is not on the list that turned out very important to our global story. That uh, this company produced pangolin skills material to cook uh, Chinese medical soap. And it's only need to uh, provincial levels permissions. And uh, as, you, as you may now see in this, uh, uh, in this Excel that uh, uh, I'll explain that uh, before 2015, every year China has the open data on how much we use. That uh, is 25, 25 tons. But after that, it is not open. The data is not open. But uh, this small company in Guangdong, they use uh, 900 kilogram in one time supply and they're asking many more. So the numbers, so they are just very one small one in all these 209 companies. In the list, there's a lot of very famous and public list Chinese medical companies. Uh, so uh, uh, the data was very suspicious that uh, 25 tons and it's not open. So uh, this is give us a big context and very important fund that a small company use that big. That big. So uh, this is about this data set. It's all about uh, related with TCM use. And also this one is we, we are doing in this map, we are doing a heat map of company legally produce medic medicine with pangolin skills. That 209 company mentioned above. The use of consumption medical was you can see is, is national wide in China in this map. Well, North is part of China, especially Jilin province. They gave out most permission to the medical companies. So uh, this is one point that is important here that uh, many NGOs and working group are trying to push. The pangolin now is still in class two protect animals. That means that the provincial level can give permission to companies. So we're asking for to lift it up to class one. That means that the uh, city council or national level, they give permission. That uh, would be more strict and uh, maybe lead to lies, uh, corruption or uh, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the next, this is the medical company and we have another one is the hospital. So also the hospital is legally used pangolin across the countries, uh, but uh, 
uh, it's uh, 712 hospitals. It's uh, from the above mentioned data set. The mo most of them are TCM, traditional Chinese medical hospital. Some of them are very, very good and very famous. In China, we have a, a TCM system, a medical system, where we have another modern medical system. In TCM hospitals, doctor use TCM plus modern medical together to treat patients. It's like a system. Uh, so it's like you can see that in, in the middle of China, uh, Henan, Shanxi, and uh, Sichuan, they gave up most, they gave them more permission to hospitals to use. But uh, I'll have to say that uh, in real life, as we heard, many Chinese doctors, they're not very commonly used because pangolin skills is very expensive and with replacement. And actually to hurt animal to get material was also not the uh, TCM practice in theory. So uh, this data is, is open to public and it's, uh, it's uh, a joint public data from the National Forest Bureau and the National TCM Control Bureau uh, that uh, uh, gave the list. In China, we have a lot of lists that uh, only company in the list can, give, can do the business, like a mask or the medical facility now that only mm -hmm. in the list you can export to other countries. So that's about this page. Thank you, Jiaming. Um, and uh, we've we've put all of uh, all of this data on a, on a website, and uh, you can find it here. Uh, invested at Earth, uh, uh, pangolin data. We've we've tried to put everything on it. If there's something missing, or you feel like there should be something else, uh, let us know. Uh, um, I think uh, the, our host will also share these links. And uh, we are almost done. I would just invite you again to uh, get the data, do the stories yourself, and um, and get in touch if you have any questions. Here's the email. And uh, one more request: we're doing a survey of environmental journalists uh, to understand what what the needs are, what the um, uh, what the greatest interests are, what the discussions are. Uh, there's the link is here. The last link, the Bitly link. We'll, we'll share that one too. And if you have time, uh, just uh, f five minutes, please do fill out the survey. And uh, thank you so much for, for uh, listening. And, um, and uh, yeah, thanks to Earth Journalism Network to share the survey. The recording and a summary will soon be at earthjournalism.net. And uh, now to your questions. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, Trang, um, Jamming, and Patrick for the very uh, inspiring um, sharing of how you've been using um, different kinds of data. Um, I think, you know, at, at, at this current moment when a lot of journalists are not able to do field reporting, um, you know, looking at existing data sources might be a good, um, you know, source uh, for your stories. So I think we, um, you know, uh, are learning a lot from what um, our speakers have been sharing today. Um, so going to questions, um, some are already answered. So if you, you know, you're, you're uh, encouraged to see um, some of the, the answers as well on the tab. Um, so um, I'll go through some questions here. Um, maybe a more general question from Ratna from India. She would like to know what diseases and problems um, those medicines um, jamming that you have shared um, uh, address? What kind of uh, illnesses do they address? Uh, it's mainly about to bring more milk to new mother and also mm -hmm. treat cancers, as I heard. It's, yeah, uh, I think one very known, um, so I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a myth, right? Um, it is yeah. a myth, actually, that it facilitates <laughs> lactation. Um, and a lot of NGOs have been working on it to, um, to you know, do kind of campaigns to educate the public that, um, you know, there is no scientific proof of, of sure, pangolin sure. Um, to uh, promote lactation. Yeah. 
Um, another question on, uh, since we are with you, Jiaming, um, there's a question from Jack Lam. Is there a clear reason why the Chinese government has stopped sharing data since 2016? I think this refers to the data from the pharmaceutical, mm. like TCM companies that are using Pangolin products. I I uh, I don't know actually, but I think, um, I think that maybe that uh, interest the people, like in the forest bureau or in the uh, medical industry, that uh, they don't like this data to send out. That gave them the big pressure because it's very huge, twenty five tons. Uh, maybe even bigger so i don't know actually um yeah there's another question i think for um all three of you um whoever uh, is keen to answer um there's a question about whether you see any difference in the kind of modus operandi um in smuggling live pangolins versus uh, smuggling of pangolin scales you see any difference in the operations I actually, if, I think this is a great question. <laughs> this is a, 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 a great, great question. Um, I would say I would distinguish between uh, mule trafficking and bulk trafficking. And the, the bulk trafficking happens usually in containers and shipping containers. And that is scales and, 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 and or frozen animals and then you have the you have the the live pangolins wouldn't be shipped like that right um and uh, i think the live animals would be more uh regionally and uh, less 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 farther like they would travel less farther uh, less farther than than scales if that makes any sense um can i keep in yeah yeah, for in Vietnam, it's a, hu a huge difference uh, between mm -hmm. live pangolins and scales. Um, first is the species. Uh, so live pangolins uh, smuggle in with inside the country is mostly the Malaysian type, um, uh, which suggests that it comes either uh, mostly from Southeast Asia, uh, while the pangolin scales and the frozen meat uh, usually comes uh, from by, by sea and by air. It's mostly in containers and they are uh, mostly for African species. Um, domestically, it's um, transportation. It's not containers. It's uh, not any big operation, but people uh, carrying around their bag, people uh, hiding um, about like 10 bunglins uh, inside a car, um, trucks, uh, all kinds of private um, and public transport. So I hope that helps. There's a question from Bernie from the Philippines. Um, and Bernie's asking um, when you are trying to collect data on um, market price, as, as um, Patrick has mentioned, um, how do you make sure you get honest responses uh, from those people who are buying and selling um, pangolin, um, especially since uh, you know, in some places it's illegal and people know that it's illegal? Um, we, it's a very good question. And, uh, of course we, we sometimes got, uh, some crazy, uh, prices. Um, uh, the, the, the best way is to just, uh, ask as many people as possible. And then you see which ones are, don't fit, uh, the pattern. Like you see patterns emerge quickly locally. And then, uh, you, you can see if some if there are exorbitant prices asked by one person by another person you 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 will notice after a while just by 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 keep you have to keep asking and keep asking and uh and uh you, you get a sense of, of of the prices thank you and then a couple of questions for jamming on tcm uh that's traditional chinese medicine um, do you think TCM will experience a boom uh, since now um, you know, there's been, there have been report, reports on how it's been used to treat coronavirus patients? Uh, I mean, is TCM effective on COVID-19? No, I think is, is do, you, do you think because uh, that it's been used to treat uh, COVID-19 patients that it will get a boost that more people will be buying TCM? 
um, TCM it was like a, a, a treasure or a, or a history gift for many Chinese people. So uh, mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of people that trust uh, TCM, especially in the old generations. But uh, I think educated big cities, young people, mm, a lot of them, they, uh, they, are, they are getting more used to the Western or modern ma medicine. Yeah, I think um, there's also this very specific question from Matt, Natalie. Um, I think from your uh, presentation just now, Jiaming, you mentioned 25 tons, I think. Is that the total, total pangolin scale that's used in TCM per year? Is that for the year of 2015 or is that the median? Yeah, that is a data that national wide used uh, legally that on the record is 25 tons. But for we one believe year? for one year, but we believe mm -hmm. the number would be much higher. Okay, thank you. Um, Rosanna Ng from Hong Kong also has a question for you, Jiaming. Um, she says uh, she understands there's a permit. Hold on. Oh, that oh, question has been oh, answered. Sorry, this sorry, disappeared just from my from screen. The, sorry, sorry okay. that was my bad. So that That's was okay. the answer on the stockpiles. Um, the uh, I understand there's a permit system for pangolin legal stockpiles sold in China between pharmaceutical companies. Where is the price for the pangolin scale sold for the legal stopper and who decides on the price? Um, you, I just shared a link uh, with Rosanna that has a, a look at the pricing so uh, she could find the prices there. I think uh, our, the information we got on the prices are, are from, the, from the pharmaceutical companies, the traders. Thank you, Patrick. I think there was another kind of related story on legal stockpile in China. I, I think that's a question mm -hmm. whether there is data on cities, um, um, you know, tracking whether they have uh, uh, data on, on uh, reg you know, registered uh, uh, legal stockpiles in China. Do you have the answer for that as well? CITES, right? CITES, that's right. Yeah, CITES don't have the the, the stock power in China. They only have the registered, very limited uh, international trade numbers. Right, if, I'm, if I may chime in, I think that's a million dollar question that a lot of um, you know, pangolin conservation um, advocacy uh, groups are looking for is to find out, because in China, it's illegal um, to import uh, pangolin um, and, and its parts, so, you know, there must be a finite amount of, of stockpiles that, that China has. And what, what is this amount of legal stockpile that they have in China that's still being used to produce um, TCM? So I think that's, that's a, a big question. And I think so far it's been really difficult to find um, data on that. Um, a question from Gono Sumyadi on uh, what is the highest proportion of pangolin as an ingredient in TCM. So I think, I <laughs> do you know <laughs> how much pangolin do they use? In... I don't know. I think yeah. it's really hard to say. Okay. Does anyone know? I, I don't know. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, there are reports of pangolin farms in Thailand and Laos um, among other Southeast Asian countries. Have you found any connections to the trafficking from those? Uh, this is a question from Jack Lam. Uh, if, if, if I'm, our reporting didn't go on, uh, we didn't do, we reported in Thailand, but we didn't do reporting on, on, on local uh, poaching. Uh, what we did report on was the smuggling of pangolins that were poached in Malaysia and in Indonesia, perhaps in Indonesia, but probably just Malaysia, and how they were smuggled uh, across Thailand. And uh, in Laos, we haven't done reporting. So, um, but uh, based on, 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 on Trang's uh, data analysis and her reporting, uh, it's a strong suggestion that it is a central, uh, it is a key trafficking route if that makes any sense. And, and to farming, it is really, really hard to farm, pang to breed pangolins. So really where they come from is poachers. 
hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think you know increasingly what we found as well is um, you know the, as as the numbers of of wild uh, pangolins in Southeast Asia um, is 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 dying out. Um, you know more and more pangolins are being smuggled from from Africa, from Nigeria, especially to Southeast Asia, than to to China as um, in, in, yeah as well as China. Um, there's a question from Aditi Patil. As journalists, what were the challenges you faced while questioning and um, gathering data, especially about TCM, especially on TCM in, in China? Um, if, I, if I may answer the question so that no one gets into trouble. Um, um, I think just the fact that I will answer the question it kind of it's, it's answers the question. Uh, it, <laughs> it's... Um, it's um, it's of course a very uh, d uh, difficult environment uh, to, it can be a challenging environment to report in. And there is a, a lack of, as we tried to show with the data, I mean, you, you can tell from, from, from what Amy was just saying on the stockpiles that there is, there is so much public interest in, in having more information uh, that is not made available. So that's why we need to find alternative data to report on a story, on this story. So I think that really shows the difficulty of, of, of reporting the story. The other problem is, of course, this is a story of crime. So it's not the story, it's mostly a story of crime. So we're talking about uh, poaching, trafficking, and illegal smuggling. And of course, those stories are always hard to report on because, uh, be because you can't just ask people uh, every, very easily. You have to go undercover. And, and the risks of going undercover and the risks of reporting or about organized crime are, are uh, substantial in, in China as they are in surrounding countries. Thank you. There's another question um, somewhat related from uh, Gaji Sharma um, from WCS. Um, he's asking whether you come across like specialist uh, professions like people in the shipping industry involved in pangolin trafficking? Mm -hmm. um, and how often do you come across uh, these professions being involved in illegal trade of, of wildlife and pangolins especially? If, if I may, I think, I, I think one of the things we really learned and we, we saw across the board uh, uh, from, from Cameroon uh, to, to China uh, and in many transit countries, is that we haven't found like people who specialize. We haven't found many people who, in the trafficking part, in the supply chain, and not many people who, who specialize in pangolins. And that really speaks to a bigger problem because uh, uh, they, uh, if, they can, if they can bring six tons of pangolin scales from Nigeria to Singapore to KL to, to Hong Kong to, to China, they can bring pretty much anything. Uh, so so um, this is really a question of, 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 of crime on a, on a wider scale that uh, really needs to be looked at. Um, uh, our colleagues at Tempo Magazine in Indonesia did a fantastic story on, uh, on, on, tr on smugglers uh, in, in Indonesia, and they found, um, they found ties, um, uh, links to to, to syndicates of um, uh, who operate, who, who uh, deal with uh, smuggle other things as well. And um, maybe I'll share the link afterwards. Fascinating read. And it really goes to show that pangolins are just one part of a portfolio of these people. Yeah, so relating to this, Michael Kuhn is asking whether you see smugglers specializing in pangolin or do you see that um, you know the same people are also smuggling other uh, wildlife and TCM ingredients like tiger bones and elephant tusks? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think you know uh, we EJN at the moment is also discussing um, a, a report with Trang here to look into um, the smuggling of, of other uh, wildlife. So it would be interesting to see some of the routes uh, in Vietnam, especially whether uh, they are similar. Um, 
there's a question on um, money laundering. So L is asking, um, yeah, do you see any sort of, uh, yeah, in terms of, of, of pangolin smuggling, um, I, th I think the question is about whether, whether do you see what, what the effect of money laundering regulation, um, whether that, ha that, that has an effect on uh, pangolin smuggling in Vietnam, Thailand, China, and, and other countries? I think that's a great, great question uh, because the payments, the payments, especially for these bigger shipments, that there are payments for these bigger shipments that are made and, and, and where do they come from and how are they made? That, that's a really great question. And uh, I, I haven't seen any evidence and I think we haven't seen any evidence that, um, that, that, that the money laundering route has led to prosecutions. What we've more seen is that there were these record seizures of ports and, uh, and, and uh, but yeah, if that answers the question. So, so I, I, I haven't, we haven't, I, have, I at least haven't seen any evidence. Okay. Um, there's a question from Guno Samyadi um, on, you know, is it correct that uh, there's a preference for Malay pangolin, for live pangolin, and for skills African pangolin, or is it just because of the distance, you know, it takes to smuggle pangolin, it's easier um, to, you know, for African pangolins to, to smuggle skills instead of live animals. Daming, do you want to or should I? Um, I think on, on TCM, on the TCM dictionary, that uh, only Chinese pangolin should be in that dictionary. All the Malay or Africa pangolin should not be used in TCM, but in practice, they're all used in China. And about alive ones, of course, alive one, if, if you want to eat pangolin, alive one will be the best, but uh, it's, this animal is very, very hard to transfer with long distance. They are very sensitive. And they are mammals like humans. They have very, a lot of emotions. So it's very hard to uh, transfer very long about live pangolin. Yeah, it sounds like it's more a logistical concern um, here that African pangolins are mostly smuggled for their parts. Yeah. Okay, and uh, there's a question from Natalie Bertrams. Um, do you have information on the numbers of African pangolins smuggled? Um, there is uh, one of our EJM partners um, called the Alps Packers, their investigative, uh, wildlife uh, investigative uh, report, reporting network based in South Africa. Um, I think Fiona from Oxpackers is actually uh, participating in this webinar. So perhaps Fiona might be able to help answer this question um, through our, our chats on, on Zoom um, because Oxpackers has uh, done a couple of stories looking at smuggling of African pangolins to Asia um, uh, for, for EJN. So, um, Patrick or anyone, do you have the answers here or um, otherwise I think, I think like, it would be great yeah, Oxpeckers to answer. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, Oxpeckers has a fantastic tool and I just wanted to showcase uh, three, three more uh, data sources that can also give you information in addition to, to Oxpeckers uh, all day. I think these four are kind of the, the go-to sources. Right. Um, yeah, there was a question just now, which I thought I would, uh, it, it has been answered, but I thought I would open up as well so everyone can hear the answers and, and um, you know, other speakers can also chime in. Um, is this question on uh, the implication of COVID-19 um, on pangolin, um, you know, now that pangolin has been, as a spotlight uh, on pangolin trade because of COVID-19 um, and sort of pangolin being suspected as an intermediate host uh, of this new virus, uh, would that sort of, you know, bring down um, um, the trafficking of pangolins? Um, any any thoughts on that, Patrick Chang or uh, Jamie? Um, 
I would, I would, I would say that uh, there are of course no more mules. That there, there, um, the people who who smuggled uh, the scales and their luggage, or, or, or um, uh, and then flew from uh, from DRC from Nigeria to, to to China to Hong Kong. They're not flying anymore, of course. And um, as far as uh, the, the the big ship, the borders are closed, so so there's less of that. But as far as the big shipments are concerned, we, we don't know. Um, there was a big seizure in uh, Malaysia uh, earlier this month, uh, several tons. Um, so that, that seems to be going on. And, and perhaps it's also not a priority right now of law enforcement. Uh, I would say something on the education of uh, of wildlife, the dangers of well of eating or, or of eating wildlife in China in this pandemic. Uh, I think the, the license or the education to public was was was, was very huge, but uh, we are still worried because by now pangolin skills are still legal used, and we don't see that uh, they are lifting it up to class one or any change, but we are only hoping so. And, and Chang, do you want to talk about sort of, um, you know, COVID and sort of that uh, driving a new uh, um, anti-wildlife trafficking laws in Vietnam that, that we are hearing about? Oh, you mean uh, COVID-19 uh, makes people, uh, well, can you repeat the question? So, so you know, with, with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the you know, there have been some responses from government, including in China, which has put on a ban on wildlife consumption. Uh, in Vietnam, um, I remember seeing reports on a, a plan to uh, come up with some new anti-wildlife uh, trafficking um, regulation. I don't know whether you've seen that as well. Uh, yeah, well, I think definitely that it would spark a debate uh, about whether to strengthen the law of uh, anti-wildlife trafficking. Um, just that uh, the last month we had a survey on about a thousand people, uh, Vietnamese people, on uh, how much do they believe that COVID-19 is from wildlife and would they uh, be supporting the government to ban the wildlife trade and all the black markets um, forever. So we had about, about like over 90% of the survey attendants um, saying that they would uh, 100% um, support the government to ban the wildlife trade. Uh, so I think in Vietnam, uh, all the communications uh, agency, they are, uh, and the NGOs, they are trying to, to drive this to uh, have an end result of uh, an infinite uh, ban. Thank you, uh, thank you, Trang. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, at, you know. Uh, at this point, there's a lot of interest in, in, in wildlife uh, trafficking um, and a lot of eyes on it. And uh, I think for journalists, it's a good time to um, do stories on wildlife and also looking at sort of, um, educating um, general public um, about the issues uh, relating to uh, wildlife trafficking and more generally looking at human pressure on, on the environment. Um, Okay, I think there's one more question that just come in from Matt uh, Summon. Um, actually responding to Elle's question, um, Nat says, I think Thailand and the environmental NGOs try to work with anti-money laundering organizations to penalize criminals during the rose boot and other wildlife smuggling a few years back um, because the penalties according to the environmental act were almost nothing for the, for the criminals. Not sure if it's true now. Okay, um, if there are no further questions, I think um, we will uh, wrap up today's webinar. Um, we've got really good questions and I thank uh, you very much for all your uh, wonderful questions. I think there's a lot of um, questions that's worth um, exploring. Um, you know, some of the questions can be developed into stories as well. So um, I thank you very much and I hope um, this webinar has been useful to you. Um, we have uh, another webinar coming out tomorrow in the Philippines um, and uh, on, on uh, wildlife trade and uh, it's linked to zoonotic diseases targeting um, 
uh, Philippines uh, journalists. Um, we have another, uh, another webinar uh, next uh, week on the 6th of May, um, looking at how we can leverage different uh, data sets um, to investigate wildlife as well as other environmental issues such as air pollution, uh, you know, food production, and uh, how COVID-19 combined with some of these uh, environmental threats are uh, um, creating, uh, uh, you know, impacting on, on the most vulnerable communities uh, in the world. Um, thank you again to uh, Patrick, um, Trang and uh, mm -hmm. Jiaming. Um, once again, the recording um, and the summary of today's webinar will be published um, on earthjournalism.net. Um, I hope you'll keep a lookout for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.